I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. Hi everyone, quick favor before we dive in. If you are digging this podcast, please do us a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. It just takes a moment and it means a ton to us. Brian Danielson is on the show today. Some of you may know him as the WWE's pro wrestler, Daniel Bryan. He's held the World Heavyweight Championship title, and he's been hugely popular in the world of pro wrestling for many years. You might even know of Brian from the reality show Total Bellas. His wife is Brie Bella. Brian has one of the most talked about wrestling stories in recent history. In 2016, he was forced to retire due to a concussion-related injury, but now he's back in the ring. We talk about how this all happened, how he was able to get cleared to wrestle again, what he learned about the topic of concussions, and how he even navigated the conversations about going back with his family. What I love about this episode is that we get to know more about the person behind the personality. Brian gives us a glimpse into areas of his life that you don't see on TV. He's an avid reader, and he's no stranger to adversity. Brian talks about everything from living in his car during his early days of wrestling— to what's important to him outside of wrestling. And he even tells us how he scored on his personality test compared to other superstar wrestlers. It's quite comical. It's not every day I interview a WWE star, but I'm really glad I got the chance to speak with Daniel. Being able to design my own day and do it in the most efficient way is a non-negotiable for me. I'm a bit of a time management nerd, so when I find something that allows me to be more efficient and effective to get the most out of my day, I want to share it with everyone. So here's the scoop. I have a new tool in my productivity tool belt, and it's called monday.com. My team and I have never felt more organized professionally and personally, and my to-do list is no longer the boss of me. I feel more in control because every project, initiative, date, and task is captured and organized in one place. And my team is in the loop and involved every step of the way. We are in lockstep. Monday.com is like having a brand new operating system. Everything has its own home, deadline. You can see the team members associated with the tasks and it's color coordinated, so you can easily navigate your own task list. We all have multifaceted jobs, businesses, and lives. With Monday, you're able to keep all of these components organized in their own compartments, but you're also one click away from seeing the big picture and how they all integrate together. Creating systems and procedures within your day and business saves a lot of time. For example, my team and I have a dedicated Monday.com board for this very podcast. Did you know that there are 28 steps involved in getting one podcast ready for air? It's the same exact process every single time, 
And it's a system that we have put into place. So we know the various key steps are assigned to certain people, and we've mapped out the entire process from start to finish within this one board. This allows us to be streamlined. It cuts back on the amount of emails exchanged as well as the amount of meetings needed. One feature I love is that my social media content calendar is built inside of monday.com. I finally have one that I actually use, I like, and it's embedded into my overall calendar as well. Another feature we use every single day is the Google Doc integration. You know I love a good spreadsheet. I can pull them into monday.com and edit them right there versus having 97 tabs open on my computer, which is extremely distracting and inefficient. If how we spend our days is how we spend our lives, then I can't think of anything more important than using the time in our days wisely. Head to hey.monday.com forward slash Amy Jo Martin to start your free trial today. That's H-E-Y dot Monday dot com forward slash Amy Jo Martin. Brian, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. I'm excited to have you on here and Let's dive right in, in the spirit of why not now. Can you tell me about a time when you had to ask yourself, why not now? You had a big decision to make, and let's talk it through that day, that minute, that hour. Yeah, so uh, so recently, so I had been forced to retire from professional wrestling uh, because I've had a lot of concussions and that sort of thing. So I recently came back from, from that. And so... Um, and when I say recently, I mean, I've just had four matches back. So I just came back literally a couple weeks ago, but there was a moment where, uh, I had kind of accepted my retirement because there's debate. The concussion issue is not objective. It's subjective, mm-hmm. right? So there was, I had been cleared by multiple neurologists, uh, well-known re- neurologists throughout the country, but then they still wouldn't clear me to wrestle. Uh, the WWE wouldn't clear me to wrestle. Uh, but these other neurologists had, that I had kind of accepted it at some point and just been like, okay, pro wrestling had been my dream since I was a little kid, right? And uh, I got a good 16 years in and all that kind of stuff, and I had kind of accepted it because, okay, maybe it's dangerous and that sort of thing. But then I was sitting by the ring watching a match. They had put me in this role, in a non-wrestling role, where I was the general manager of the show. Mm -hmm. Sit out by the ring. (laughs) <laughs> and I was watching these guys wrestle. And they were two of my friends that I'd known for years, right? A guy named Dean Ambrose and AJ Styles. And I was sitting there, and they're both really good. And the crowd's going crazy. I was just like, you know what? I I refuse to accept this. <laughs> and then, so I had been cleared by neurologists at Barrows Neurological Clinic in Phoenix, Arizona. I'd been cleared by neurologists, a team of neurologists at UCLA. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to start searching and for I'm going to go to anybody who will want to see me some more um, explorative stuff just to further my case as to why I should be cleared and uh, I started doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy started working with the Joe Namath Institute in Florida and all these different types of people and uh, lo and behold so that first like that moment where it was like you know what I do not accept this I'm going to push forward it's that was 2016, and it took me uh, another another year and a half before I got cleared, but but I did it. <laughs> wow! And and so this is it's really fascinating that you were able to navigate this and and get to the point that you wanted to get to. That being said, concussions in this topic is obviously it's it's a big unknown and and hot topic. And we've had Troy Aikman on the show, and I, I asked him about it. And you did you, you even had seizures in the past? Is that correct? Yes, I had four post concussion seizures. Okay, so just excuse my ignorance, but <laughs> aren't you kind of nervous, or isn't your family a little scared? So we were talking to the doctor at Barrows Neurological Clinic. His name was Doctor Doctor Javier Cardenas, 
and um, Brie was there when he explained everything and how everything worked. Brie was actually became okay with it. She said, he said, look at how your husband's brain is working. Right. And so I scored very high on the neuropsychological exams. Um, there's on all the tests that they ran with me, both like verbal in front of somebody where I, with the neuropsychological exam, I had to be in front of somebody for, for four hours, right. Doing these tests and then all the brain MRIs and, and, um, that sort of thing. They, they said, your husband's brain is functioning at a very high level. And if he had any sort of damage in there, it wouldn't work like this, right? You would show signs of deterioration or you would show signs of this or that, you know? And obviously it was a more extensive conversation than that. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden Brie became okay with me wrestling. And that was actually the, one of the biggest factors in me coming back was Brie's support. Um, because anybody who's going through this, obviously – I don't want to put myself at risk or my family's future at risk or anything like that. But Bree's support, she was the one who was pushing me and being like, hey, if you really want to do this, you have to fight for it. You know what I mean? This isn't going to be something – they're not just going to all of a sudden two years from now just be like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess we'll let you wrestle now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's not how this works. So if, you're, if you want to wrestle, you have to fight for it. And, uh, and so she was actually a big supporter. And you did. Well, it's interesting to see of, of all the people I've interviewed and, and these why not now moments that they're navigating, most of the time there's some adversity that they're leveraging. And in your case, it seems like that was, you know, as you sat there and watched from the sidelines and, and you wanted to get back in to the ring, it, that adversity really drove you to be able to had the persistence too, because it took, like you said, a year and a half. So, wow. Well, thank you for walking us through that because it is a, a question and I'm sure a lot of people are, are curious of how did you navigate those conversations even with your, your wife? And that's, it's pretty cool that you were able to have those intense types of medical just analysis to be able to have some peace of mind too. Yeah. And so, and what, and one of the things that, that Bree you know, Brie, as the wife who's who, you know, we plan on being together until until this whole thing is over, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> until, until this wild, crazy life is over. You know that we plan to be together, and so so she's the one that is going to have to deal with me if I have problems when I'm seventy, right? So she yeah. was the one I was concerned most with. It's like she didn't want me to do it. I wouldn't have done it. You know what I mean? And so her support was actually key to all of this, and her kind of helping to drive me. It's really a fascinating scenario as all of this, you know, conversation at a macro level is happening. And it's, I, I bet, you know, people are watching closely and really studying how you did navigate this whole process. So it's, it's very interesting. And um, let's, let's switch over to a little bit of a lighter note. Okay. <laughs> so I have this just curiosity about the psychology of your character, not just yours, but within professional wrestling and WWE, how long does it take you to get in and out of character? So I am very fortunate in the sense of that for the most part, I'm just me, right? And But one of the things that it took me a long time to get comfortable with, so I am not a natural entertainer. Like I loved wrestling from the time I was a little kid, but when I first started wrestling, uh, they put me under a mask because my face wasn't very expressive. I was very good at the technical mm. wrestling aspect of it, but I was very poor at the entertainment aspect of it. And I would they uh, so we when I first started, it was in a small small company in Texas, and they had a li really local TV show. And you know we do these interviews, right, where you're supposed to like hype up the fights and all this kind uh -huh. of stuff. And they interview me, and I am just the blandest good guy you will ever see. Well, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do my best. And it's like, it probably, I didn't even have as much inflection as I said, just right now talking to you. <laughs> and it was just like, wow, this is really, really bad. And it took me a long time to get comfortable even talking in front of a crowd out there in your spandex underwear, right? <laughs> like yeah. it's just, it's just a lot. And I'm somebody who, um, 
Like I was never good at public speaking in high school. In fact, there was I was trying to read a, a paper in my English class my senior year of high school, and I literally had to stop like three paragraphs in because I was getting so nervous, and I literally just had to sit back down and like the teacher told me like, "Hey, it's okay. You don't you don't have to you don't have to finish." Like three paragraphs into like it's like a book report or something like that, <laughs> and it's like going from that into speaking in front of. Uh, at first you're only speaking in front of maybe like 30 or 40 people, you know, in these small wrestling halls or whatever it is. And then to speaking in front of 5,000, 6,000, sometimes as many as 70,000 people, right? It's, that's a, a real, a real learning curve. So for me, it was just getting comfortable being who I am and being comfortable with the character with me just being me. And just you put forward like some of the additional quirky parts of yourself and kind of amplify them. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So you've recently come back and you were gone for several years, right? You've been a live performer for so long. Did it just come right back or I'm sure you had some additional nerves. How do you deal with the nerves before you are performing live? Well, you know, it's really interesting. So my um, my first wrestling coach was a great professional wrestler named Shawn Michaels. And he had said, uh, when we had first started, he said, the moment that you're not nervous before you go out there, that's when you need to retire. And it's really funny because when I came back from my retirement, I was actually probably the most relaxed I've ever been as far as going out and going to wrestle. And it was more so just this feeling of pure joy at being able to do what I love doing again. But also the fact that like, I used to put so much stress on myself as far as trying to be trying to put out the best match possible. I got to go out there and entertain as much as I possibly can. And now it's just such a joy and a gift to be able to come back that the joy is in the performance as opposed to, oh, I have to go out there and be the best or anything like that. So uh, it's actually been kind of fascinating for me to observe. You know, if you can sit back and observe yourself mentally as far as the space that you're at when you're about to do something, the space that I'm at right now, when, right before I go out there, I'm just very relaxed and very grateful that I'm that I'm able to get back to doing what I love. That's awesome that, that you've arrived here, and it's almost it's just such gratitude that – helps calm that influx of potential nerves. Even in the past, was there anything, just tips or tricks that you would do? So for people who are listening that maybe are having a tough time with speaking up or public speaking or just really kind of standing up, anything that you would suggest to them? (laughs) So, I mean, uh, so I I would say this, uh, getting ready for a professional wrestling performance is different than okay, <laughs> talking to your boss because so like sometimes, really? sometimes I, would get, I would get really nervous about going out and doing these these interviews that I have to do right like in front of all these people and so some of the things that I would do you probably wouldn't want to do right before you're going and like hey I'm, I do. I want to talk to my boss about a promotion or something like that because I what I would do is when I start shadow boxing. And then two, sometimes I do this. Ah! Ah! <laughs> well, you never know if you're in the bathroom at work and you need to. <laughs> you know, it's a different type of, mm-hmm. of motivating yourself. Okay, you know, like getting all the – but I think one of the things that, that can help is getting all the excess, like the, um, the nervousness. Um, that's why I do that. So, like, it was weird because even when I was the general manager um, – before I go out there and do the interview stuff, I would, would needed to do something physical like uh, shadow boxing or like something like that just to get those nerves out of me, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I could relax to go out and remember and say the things that I need to say and and express them concisely and all that kind of stuff. So, so maybe maybe that would help people. I'm not sure. Well, actually. I mean, I think it's proven and, and there's science behind physiologically how you can kind of, you can deal with, with fear if you move your body and and there are these things called fear melters that I learned from from a psychologist and 
certain stances and stuff, you know. So if you move your body in certain ways, so you're just taking that to like the nth degree. Uh, <laughs> but I can see, you know, they even show the power stance. If you stand with your legs apart and your hands on your hips, there's science that proves it changes your kind of physical makeup for a certain amount of time. So, no, I think that's actually good. I think you've got some great advice. And I also <laughs> believe like in – being able, I do a lot of like breathing stuff to calm to calm myself. I, like we live, as wrestlers, we live almost a very high stress lifestyle where it's like constantly, it's constantly um, traveling back and forth. And so you you wrestle late at night, right? So uh, a lot of times our shows won't get over until eleven o'clock or later, you know. And then you drive 150 miles, and then you get to your hotel, and then how do you get to sleep? And then how do you have normal conversations with your friends, family, all that kind of stuff when you've just been on this high or you're sleep deprived and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm a big believer in breathing exercises and meditation as far as just being able to calm and give yourself, giving yourself a sense of purpose as far as like, okay, for my day, what is my purpose for this day? Both in terms of not just my job, but also in terms of my relationships and that sort of thing. Just taking that sort of time to uh, breathe, calm yourself, and then focus on the things that are most important. That's huge. It's good to hear you say that. I mean, just even us emailing back and forth two or three days ago, and you still hadn't even been to Saudi Arabia yet. Now you're back in North America. Like, whoa. So one of the things that I really think is funny is right before Saudi Arabia, we were in Louisville, Kentucky. So I went from Louisville, Kentucky to Saudi Arabia, and now I'm in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. And I think, man, 75 years ago, there probably wasn't a single person in this entire world who had gone straight from Louisville to Saudi Arabia within the span of two days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the culture changes, absolutely. And so I just have to ask because I started meditating a few years ago and I've, I've changed and kind of evolved, but what kind of meditation do you do? So it varies. I, um, my standard med- meditation is just 100 breaths, right? I find deep breathing um, to be the thing that relaxes me the most. And so especially, so if I can find a place to sit cross-legged and I need my back against the wall, which is kind of weird, but I need that against the wall. And then um, I just count a hundred breaths, but it's, it's deep breaths. So sometimes it takes me 20 minutes or more to do my hundred breaths, but it's just really focusing on my breaths. I've tried actually using some meditation apps, but they don't, some of them have been, they work for a little bit as far as like, cause I, I've always interested in trying different types of meditation. Um, but the one that I stick with regularly is just the hundred breaths. Mm, that's interesting. I used to do meditation apps and then kind of graduated into TM and went and got the training for that. But I notice, and to your point about breathing, a lot of times I'm saying my mantra with my breath. And so it's basically I'm doing deep breaths and then eventually it kind of levels out. But and then you're you're vegan, is that correct? So I'm vegetarian, and I don't like using the term vegan anymore because okay. like I'm mostly vegan, but the vegan I think turns off a lot of the term vegan turns off a lot of people too, and it also sometimes some people very few, but there's a, a part of the vegan community who are very judgmental, <laughs> and so like <laughs> I was I was strict vegan, and I was the WWE uh, World Heavyweight Champion. And I was getting all this criticism because the championship belt that I would wear to the ring oh, is made of leather. Okay. And it's like, why are you wearing that belt? It's made of leather. <laughs> and it was just like, I don't have that control over that. Right, right. <laughs> kind of like back to the doctors. Like if there are only certain things you can <laughs> you can control. So yeah, I, I you know, I and I also really like the term plant based more than anything else because uh, you know, the more so than than judging people or anything like that. I think for healthy lifestyles, I think the more plants you eat, the better. And I just think the better for the planet too. So mm-hmm. yeah, I prefer the term plant-based or vegetarian or whatnot. So there you go. Okay. Did, did, did you find that that was a little bit of leverage or, or helpful when you're speaking with all these doctors as far yes. as you're okay. healthy? So, well, getting back to the concussion stuff, one of the things that I find fascinating is the stuff that they don't talk about, right? So with the CTE stuff, which is 
chronic traumatic encephalopathy or something like that. So they said, okay, the first um, person that they diagnosed with that was a, a football player named Mike Webster. And he had this tau protein in his brain, which they associate with early Alzheimer's, um, that now they associate with CTE. And so, so they said, oh, well, he's had a lot of concussions. So concussions equals tau protein and CTE. But what they've also found is that uh, people who have used a lot of testosterone in their life or steroids, have they also find these changes when they've done it in, in rats and mice and stuff like that. They inject them with testosterone, and then when they pass away, oh my gosh, they have this tau protein in their brain that's associated with CTE. And a lot of those late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s football players did massive amounts of steroids, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also uh, studies that show eating lots of animal protein also increases your chance of early onset Alzheimer's. The animal protein translates in your brain into tau protein as you get older. Uh, and so there are studies that show that as well. So there's not like this specific thing that these things, like eliminating a lot of that kind of stuff, I think only helps my cause. I'm not saying that those are like, that's why my brain is healthy or anything like that. But there are studies out there that are showing that there's more than there's more than one thing that causes some of this stuff. And so especially when you look at, so they've specifically focused on football players, right? Mm -hmm. The CTE studies. But when you look at how professional athletics works here in the United States, especially football where you're encouraged to be big and strong and all that kind of stuff, where how, many, how, much, how much animal protein are these guys getting every day? It's tons, right? Like way more you know, when they talk about the uh, paleo diet, right? No caveman ever ate this much meat, you know? <laughs> like yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. You're, you're like, we do it because it packs on muscle and it does so quickly. But the long-term effects of doing that, uh, people don't really know or they don't really pay attention to it. Um, Michael Greger has a great book called How Not to Die. And it's, it's a horrible title. That sounds like a very negative mm -hmm. title. Like I, it'd be better to be like how to live right. or something <laughs> like that. But he he goes through like the top 15 causes of death and how a lot of them are diet related. And if people ate more plants, a lot of those things would 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 disappear, you know. Um, so and then one of the things that he talks about is Alzheimer's in there. And he has some studies in there talking about that. So so, yeah, it, it's all fascinating stuff. But, you know, I, I'm not a doctor. I just. I read things here or there and then some, you know, your mind attaches to things that you already believe in, right? Mm -hmm. Like the studies that say like, okay, if you, most people now get their news from sites that are just going to recycle things that they already think, right? Or reinforce mm -hmm. things that they already in think. In their echo chamber. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so like, I'm, uh, I'm a big, I love environmental issues and that sort of thing. So I follow all of these environmental things on Twitter. So if I, you scroll through my newsfeed, like you'd think, man, the world's in a horrible place environmentally. <laughs> and that would be your main focus, right? Whereas if you are a very conservative person, you read all these things that like make, just reinforce your ideas that keep you to the right or Democrat reinforce these ideas that keep you to the left and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So I, I read and gravitate towards things that, show that reinforce in my mind that um, plant-based lifestyle is the way to go. Makes sense. So what's one thing that you've had to learn as a lesson more than once? Oh, my gosh. First thing that pops into mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, I think the, and I'm still learning it, is I am not um, – it, despite what it sounds like, I'm not very motivated, right? I forget what the word is. Uh, like, a, I'm very much somebody who just accepts things as they come for the most part. So in wrestling, I was getting very popular. And the WWE still didn't want to push me to the top level because, like, I'm si of my size. I'm a smaller guy. I, uh, like, if... A normal person just looks at me like if I'm coming down the ramp on TV, 
you're you don't gravitate towards towards looking at me as opposed to like a John Cena who's like enormous, right? Or uh, some of the some of the bigger guys like a Hulk Hogan or a Steve Austin or The Rock, where you as soon as they come down the ramp, you're like, wow, look at that guy, right? And so and that's what WWE typically wants from their top stars. But I've never been very good at like going and saying like, hey, you guys should uh, do more with me, or you should do this, or you should do that with me. Like I've never been. I've never been motivated by that or somebody who like pushes myself towards that or pushes myself towards financial goals or pushes myself towards anything other than just doing the things that I love to do. And so I'm constantly having to remind myself like, Hey, to get to the next level of where I want to be, I actually do have to do some pushing here. And so, yeah, that's a, that's a constant thing that I struggle with. That's really interesting, especially given what you did and how motivated you were to get back to wrestling. So do you feel like that gave you a taste of what can happen when you when you actually get persistent? <laughs> yeah, the, the term that I was looking for was ambition, and it was really oh, funny. Okay. WWE did this, uh, they did this personality t- test with some of their more successful wrestlers to see like, okay, are there some common traits amongst these people that makes them successful so that when we're recruiting other people, if they have these traits or whatever it is, that they'd be more likely to be successful. And uh, they, so they ask you all these questions, yada, yada, yada. I got my test results back and the lady was just baffled. She was like, you have the lowest ambition score I've <laughs> ever seen. Like they do it in percentiles, right? From zero to a mm-hmm. hundred. And I was in the bottom one percentile of ambition And she's like, how on earth are you successful at this? And I said, I don't know. I just really love to wrestle. (laughs) (laughs) So, so yeah, so I have to, I have to push myself sometimes to be, to be more ambitious. So, oh my gosh, this is, well, and maybe there's a a connotation around ambition. Then there's some relative words that maybe you're super humble or you're super content or I, I don't know. It just, it sounds so negative, but I actually am thinking there are probably some really amazing, strong, positive qualities about this. If you look at it from a different angle, it reminds me of, um, I used to work in the NBA for the Phoenix Suns and during training, one of the, the guys on the team, his name is Boris Diaw and he's a French guy, and he liked his cappuccino. And this is a secondhand story, so I wasn't right there. But evidently, they're doing their vertical leaps, and, like, you've got Amari Stoudemire on the team at the time and all these stars, Steve Nash and Shaquille O'Neal, you name it. And Boris, who is not known for his vertical in games and stuff, he has the highest. Like, it's just all of a sudden everybody's like, how – where where did this come from? We didn't know you could do this. And the coach, Mike D'Antoni, said to him, Boris, where have you been? Like, what? And he's like, I don't, I don't need to jump that high. <laughs> he just basically said, I, I can do it, but I haven't really found the need. Right. And everybody's just blown away, and, and he just thought it wasn't a big deal. But maybe you're, you're like that. You know, you've just, you've just got it, but you don't need to. <laughs> yeah, well, so, uh, so, so part, of, part of, I think, the – the flaw is in the testing because they are, I think they're judging ambition for worldly material things. Right. And so like my, my big plan for financially and all that kind of stuff was like, man, if I could just get like a little tiny house and live on like a little piece of land, I'd be set. And then I wouldn't have to work and I wouldn't need like all this kind of stuff. Right. So I, I think I, so I, I think I do have ambition, like, but my ambition is different. So my ambition is not to be, my ambition has never been, I'm going to be the greatest wrestler in WWE history. My ambition has always been, I'm going to be the best wrestler that I can be. Right. Like I want to, because I also, one of the weird things that people don't understand about wrestling is that like it can, the way I look at it is more of like an art form, right? It's an art form as far as storytelling, as far as what you're, what you're doing when you're out there. Some people don't look at it like that. That's how I look at it. And that's how I keep working on trying to perfect my craft in the same sense that some musicians well past their peak as far as how many albums they sell uh, keep experimenting musically, keep playing music till the day that they die, because 
that's what they love to do and that's how their brain works and that's what that's what they're entranced by and all that sort of thing i kind of think that same thing with me about wrestling is that like before i ever got to wwe i wrestled for for 10 years on the independent circuits and really didn't didn't make very much money and it like i was still really happy with that like one of the things is that uh i was living in santa monica and sleeping on a dojo floor, like just on a mat and like interspersed between that and living and sleeping in my car and stuff. And then, so this was for an extended period of time and people, people have said to me, it's like, wow, that must've been really tough. It was, I never thought of it as tough and it was actually a very fun period of my life. And I never thought of it as like, oh man, this stinks. I have to sleep on this dojo floor. I have to sleep in my car or, uh, or anything like that. It was a wonderful experience. Those sort of things never bothered me. I think part of that is, um, like, I was really lucky. I f- I feel very fortunate that I grew up without very much money, and my mom was a, a huge, huge inspiration. Like, so she's my mom and dad got divorced when um, when we were young, and she didn't have all she had was her high school education. When they were married, she was a stay at home mom. And then all of a sudden she has to reenter the workforce. So then she starts going to school and working two jobs and all this kind of stuff. And all the time, you know, we didn't have very much money, but it didn't matter because we felt loved, right? Like I never felt like, oh no, we don't have very much money, you know? And that really, I think that when you grow up like that, that some people grow up without very much money and they're in a situation where their family isn't there for them as much as my mom was there for my sister and I, to mm-hmm. the point where we didn't feel a lack because we didn't have money. Only objectively now as an adult do I realize how poor we were, right? <laughs> and yeah. then um, You didn't know anything different either, right? I didn't know anything different, and I felt loved, and I, I felt like, every, like my mom really, every accomplishment, no matter how small, was the greatest thing, right? Like, I was a very good student. Uh, oh man, you got an A in art class? Wow, that's awesome, right? <laughs> like, yeah, that's you know, awesome. Like all these, all these different things where it. Oh wow, you're you were the C Squad MVP of your basketball team. That's so good. Okay, if you're, I was a sophomore and I was on the C Squad. If you're on the C Squad team in a sophomore in a very small town. Odds are you're probably not very good, and I wasn't. <laughs> but but she celebrated every little accomplishment. You know what I mean? I, I mean, and just made us feel really loved. So that material things were never were never the point. Were never the thing that that made me feel like those are the things that make me happy. So that's so it's so cool to hear you talk that all the way through. I mean, from the the personality tests, right, with the ambition, the scores, and then redefining your ambition is just defined differently and and your love for the art of wrestling or whatever you're doing. But even as you are sharing, you know, sleeping in your car and still having, and, and even when you're younger, your baseline for happiness and joy just seems like it's just high. It's it's above average, right? So it's 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 really cool to hear you talk all the way through that. So a few rapid fire questions and then I'll let you go. What are you reading right now? Okay, so I'm reading The Overstory by uh forget by who it's by. So that's I no no questions feel ever feel like rapid fire for me. I'm sorry. That's okay. So I tried to read I tried to read a book a week. So last week wow. last year I read 54 books. Oh wow. Do you post them anywhere? I've seen you tweet them. Like on World Book Day, I saw you tweet. Yeah, yeah, it just so happened to be World Book Day and I'm also not very good at social media. I like I'm not that's not my my thing. I'm trying to get better at it, but that's uh, like that's where my ambition fails me, right? It's like, okay, I could be doing this stuff, but uh it's not really my thing. I don't really like it. So, but I'm reading The Overstory right now. Fiction usually takes me longer than nonfiction, but the other book that I'm reading right now is uh, Micro Trends Squared. And it's talking about like the the trends, the micro trends that are going on that are going to shape the world in the next twenty or thirty years. Wow! Do you have an all time favorite book? No, and yes. Uh, if I, you were, it changes on a weekly basis, probably depending on the the time of day. But I really love *Sapiens* by Yuval Noah Harari mm-hmm. and his follow up book *Homo Deus*. Uh, with *Sapiens* is the 
history of the human species. And Homo Deus is, is kind of a follow-up to that as far as where humans are going next in theory based on what everybody's pursuing. So I, I just found it fascinating philosophically. Oh, I think it's fascinating. You read about a book a week, if not more. So are any tricks or things you do to be able to get through a book in a week? Are you audio? Or are you reading? Is it because you travel so much? It's because I travel so much, but it's also, uh, so I, I've drawn a line in, in the sand with myself and this is a really weird thing to do, but like we went to Saudi Arabia and I refused to watch movies on flights and my, my wife. My wife thinks it's a form of self-torture, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, I just feel like there was a point when I was going to Japan a lot early in my career, and I was just like, man, I could be, instead of watching these movies, I could be reading or something like that, and I just find I'm, if I watch a movie, my there's less going on mentally in my head as far as like interesting thoughts that I have than if I'm reading a book. And like, I feel like I engage more with books than I do with movies, even if it's fiction. And so I just find my life to be more interesting when I read more as opposed to watch more. Although that has sometimes flipped on its head because I don't watch hardly any television or, or very many movies. So when people are talking about like, oh, have you seen Breaking Bad or whatever, whatever the hot show is, right? I'm yeah. just like, I can't participate in those conversations. Like, no. Nope. That makes me feel a little bit left out, but, you know. That's but when then, you say, do you, well, have you read so-and-so or read this book? <laughs> well, no, it's not <laughs> that. It's talking about the ideas in the books more so than anything else. As far as one of the things that I find fascinating to talk to people about is the idea that uh, right now, human, like we get all this negative stuff in the news, right? But humanity is at a better point than it's ever been in human history, right? That's one of the things that uh, you all know Harari talks about. There's a new book called Enlightenment Now that I just recently read by Stephen Pinkert or something like that. But it, it's talking about how, like, hey, you know, we there's all this negative stuff on the media about all all the negative things that are going on. But realistically, there's less violence now than there's ever been before per capita. There's less starvation now than there's ever been in human history. More people now die from overeating than undereating, which is like, mm -hmm. what? Like that yeah. blows your mind, right? You know, and so much so I just recently did this deep dive into the Revolutionary War. And you can stop me if I'm rambling. Because no, keep going. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just love I love talking about ideas. But so I I watched the the Broadway play Hamilton, right? And just became fascinated by what I did and did not know about the Revolutionary War. So I started reading a bunch of books about it. And then so, you know, you're talking about uh, like Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and all these people have a very intimate knowledge with death because death surrounds them all the time. Alexander Hamilton's mom died in bed like with him, right? In this small apartment thing and like they see people die all the time right it's a regular part of their life is this idea of life and death and you talk about the the militia men who were in the revolutionary war and they're marching 20 miles a day sometimes in the winter they're doing it in the snow and they don't even have shoes right and they stop and they just curl up and die because it's so cold and then you think of that because that's how life has been for most of human history is that like you have this intimate knowledge with death. And now we are very fortunate that we don't have this such an intimate knowledge with death, right? Where it's like, I haven't, so my dad passed away uh, a couple of years ago and it like, it hit me so hard. Right. And it was really like really, really hard on me. And one of the reasons is because I loved him so much, but another reason is because we are very fortunate these days to not have such a deep, intimate knowledge with, of death, mm. that it doesn't surround us all the time. So that's kind of this framework that I really like right now is this idea when people start complaining about this or that. And I like to, I, I like to bring up these, these ideas that like, hey, okay, you're complaining about this, but look, we're 35,000 feet above the air eating food food that is like it's probably more calories than we actually need on our way to Saudi Arabia 
A right. hundred years ago, this would be impossible, you know? <laughs> right. Oh, uh, I love I it. So. You're you're applying and having these conversations based on what you're reading and educating others, too. Yeah, well, I mean, I think more so than educating others, I just think it brings up interesting conversations yeah. more so than anything else. Like what I strive for is not – I don't strive to be entertained. I strive for connections with other people. Uh, on the flight back from Saudi Arabia, I was sitting next to a guy who's a WWE guy named Rusev. And, you know, we joke back and forth here and there on, um, you know, when we're at shows, but it's not like we've ever really sat down and had conversations. Well, on the flight back from Saudi Arabia, I feel like because of some of these interactions, now, like, we are more connected because instead of just him just watching the movie, I mean, we both slept a lot. It was a long flight, but, <laughs> but we had, we connected and had these conversations based on ideas of this and that. He grew up in Bulgaria, which is fascinating, right? All this kind of stuff. And so I think ideas, when you talk to people about ideas and people can join with ideas, uh, that brings about a connection. So Yeah, absolutely it does. And that's the power of, I think, books and then having discussions about them. You know, it's like when we were little, we did book reports and we'd have to d- discuss a lot of times now you read some. Well, I know I've, I'll read something and you talk about it maybe a little bit, but it's it should be more of hopefully having those meaningful, deeper conversations versus the small talk of any any sorts, which I just can't do anymore. That's one of the reasons. So one of the things I'd really like to do is start is join a book club, but I'm not at home enough to do it. But I think like, man, if you could join a book club and have like a bunch of people talking about the same idea in different yeah. people's takes same idea. I think that would be a lot of fun. You could start one so easily on social, start your own and it could be virtual. Yeah. So I had tried to do that on, um, on my wife's YouTube channel. We're hijacking our YouTube channel for a book club. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but the thing was, is that when we recorded the first video of my book review of, uh, it was something, something utopia. It was like, a like a, a realistic version of utopia. And it's talking, uh, so I did this thing. My first video was like 25 minutes long, and I was trying to keep it short talking about all these ideas, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Brie was like, okay, nobody's going to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> so then I condensed it to five minutes, but then it's like, then it, how can you condense a, a book? that's, you know, that's talking about complex ideas in five minutes and you, you can't. You could do just little snackable snippets on Instagram or Twitter. Just record yourself what, like a couple of minutes. It doesn't have to be the whole book, but then have other people do it. All your fr- fans too. How cool would it be to be co-reading a book, you know, for your fans with you? And, I don't know. You should maybe, maybe just try a little different approach. Yeah, then your 25 minutes. So, uh, so for the view, for the listeners who don't know, Fred um, Nguyen is the one who introduced Amy and I. And uh, maybe I'll talk with Fred about it. He's really good with the social media yeah. stuff. And I'll talk with him about how, how I can do something that I'm passionate about and then put it on social media. And that might engage me more with social media. Who totally. Knows? <laughs> totally, because it's fascinating to hear this from you. You know, a lot of people probably don't realize. So I, I will totally support you. If you name the book, I'll read it. I'll be your first okay. <laughs> uh, book club member. Okay, so pirates or ninjas, who's tougher? I, I love pirates. I, what a fascinating thing. Do you have any backup for that or you just love them? It's just like a wild lifestyle, right? To mm-hmm. be a pirate, to go out and like when you live in the sea and like all that kind of stuff as far as like scurvy and dangers and all that kind of, but you're, you're just like a, nobody kind of holds you de- Like ninjas, I feel like are, it's a very top down organization, right? <laughs> yep. So you follow, you follow, they give you directives and you have these skill sets as a ninja and you just follow those directives. Whereas a pirate is more like doing things on their own or at the very least, there's the captain of the pirate ship. And so you're just following this one man that you kind of intimately know as opposed to uh, you're a ninja and you're following orders from like a grand organization. Mm, that's one of the best explanations and uh, theories <laughs> I've heard. And I ask this question a lot. And I, I agree. I think I think they're tougher. I don't know. I think there's a difference, too, in the question. Who would win in a battle versus who's tougher? Right. Yeah, and I yeah, think well, and, pirates are tougher. And it's not even necessarily t- 
toughness versus because that is an individual it's a personal thing some i'm sure some pirates are tougher than some ninjas and some ninjas are tougher than some pirates depending on the person but i just think about lifestyle like which lifestyle would i rather live i'd rather be a pirate same same okay great answer what keeps you up at night uh gosh mostly the things that i'm afraid of are environmental things climate change pollution um the extinction of uh, species and all of these things going forward with my um, with our baby who is about to turn one year old, mm. and so the world that she's going to live in, and this idea that all the stuff with climate and and the the ecosystem and everything we needed to start working on it years ago, and we knew the science about it years ago, and yet we're still going backwards, and uh, that is really terrifying. And for the final question, what advice would you give to your younger self? (sighs) Don't worry about it. Things happen good and bad. And regardless of what happens, you're going to be okay. You know, in this day and age, like most of us, even if you get really sick or you break your leg or whatever it is, most of us are going to be okay. I probably would have said spend more time with my dad before he passed away because you think, so this is what I always thought. I always thought. I will go and do my wrestling thing where I travel all over the world, right? And then when I'm done, I'll be able to come back and spend all this time with my family. But then if somebody passes away before you're done, then you just missed a lot of time with somebody that you love. And so I think I, maybe that's more of, more of something. I would have taken more time off to go spend time with my dad and my mom and my sister and my nieces and all that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah, I think that would be number one. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been so fun to get to know you, and I'm fascinated by who you are, and I'm excited to follow along and hopefully learn about some cool books too. Um, But I really appreciate your time. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Amy. everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now?